One of the most common complaints with brakes are going to be brake vibrations. You step on the brake pedal, the pedal starts thumping. Sometimes if it's really bad, the steering wheel, the whole car starts shaking, okay? Brake rotors do warp. Um, if the warp isn't excessive, uh, you can turn the rotors is what it's called. What we're doing is we're truing the rotors again. I wanted to focus real quickly on a couple of different style of rotors. We're going to be working on hubless rotors today. Uh, maybe hubbed rotors would be another day, although they're kind of going out of in vogue mostly on older cars at this point. Uh, this would be a hubbed rotor. The rotor has the hub attached to the rotor. Okay, mostly older style up into the 90s or so. There, you might find a few examples of the style of rotor. But you can see the bearings actually go inside of the hub and this goes onto a spindle um, onto the car. What's far more common today, we're talking 98%, are going to be hubless rotors. Okay, you can see uh, there's nowhere to put wheel bearings. The wheel bearings are bolted right onto the car. Uh, these are lighter. These are easier to manufacture. These also have a tendency to warp more. Okay, so we're cutting these a lot more. We're going to work with the hubless. What we're going to do when we're cutting the rotors is we're going to need a reference point. We need to know where zero is so we know where to cut where our variation is uh, from there. If you look at the inside, we're going to, this part of the rotor be in the drop center. Okay, of the rotor itself. You can see where this is all rusty. If I try to hook this rotor up to the brake lathe using this as a reference point with the rust, you got to figure I've got a thousand to maybe three thousandths of rust on this rotor. And I'm sure the rust isn't going to be smooth either. So what I need to do is clean the inside of the rotor up so basically it looks, now yes this is a new rotor, I'm cheating, I'm trying to save time here, but I want to clean up the drop center of the rotor so I have a nice clean surface to work with and it's important what's important is this this area here is clean of rust and we're gonna use a die grinder to do that first thing we need to do before we turn the rotors is we need to determine if the rotor is even salvageable um, when we're turning the rotors we are removing metal the less metal we have the the less uh, metal we're gonna have for heat dissipation and the not dangerous side of it the rotors are just going to warp again because the heat has nowhere to transfer to so it's going to stay within the rotor and heat the rotor uh, worst case scenario we can start getting heat uh, heat cracks with the rotor and we're going to run into a situation where the rotor is not safe to be on the vehicle okay so we could have a brake failure problem so measuring the rotor making sure that the rotor is thick enough is a very important step um, we're going to use a brake micrometer to do that um, we need the specifications for the rotor. The specifications are stamped on the rotor somewhere on any new rotor, any reputable new rotor anyways. Of course, after a couple years, especially here in the, in the Great White North, Buffalo, New York, uh, we start getting rust and you can't read the numbers anyways. Also with these rotors, uh, the specs are quite often, which is the case with this one, the specs are in millimeters. Uh, being an old guy, I like to reference everything in thousands of an inch. I still think in thousandths of an inch. Uh, so what I did was uh, we looked on all data to get the specifications for the brake rotor and we can determine how much, if any, we can take off of this rotor uh, and, and the rotor still be safe. One of the most common mistakes I see people, uh, not just students, but people in general using with a micrometer is they start tightening and they over tighten the micrometer on the rotor or whatever they're tightening. They actually tighten on the barrel. There's quite a difference I mean, I've got some drag here, but there's quite a difference between that and that, and which one is the real reading, okay? With that in mind, there's going to be, sometimes there's a ratchet mechanism. This is a slip ring on the end, but there's actually a slip ring. So how much do I tighten the micrometer? This isn't just a brake micrometer. This is any micrometer. I don't use the barrel per se. I can, you know, to get it close to where I want, I can tighten it. But when I'm tightening, how much do I tighten the micrometer? I tighten it right here at the end, in this case on the slip ring, some of them are ratchet mechanisms. So that's as tight as I get it. That's why it's built into a micrometer. So that is as tight as we get. Wiggle it around, make sure I've got a good reference. I put the lock on, and if I put it on tight, it should slide uh, right off. Looking, this is why I wore my readers, by the way. Uh, looking at my specification, I'm at 955 thousandths. Uh, thickness on the rotor, my specification is 890 thousandths, so I'm able to remove about 60 thousandths worth of material and still be able to stay within specification.
Okay, what we're going to do now is we want to mount the rotor onto the brake lathe, obviously. Uh, this is an Amco 4000 brake lathe. This is a relatively new lathe. Uh, I believe it's only a year or two old. Uh, to give you an idea of the same design, you might be in a shop that's 35, 40 years old. They're using pretty much the same lathe. They've tried other variations. It's a tried and true design. Uh, pretty much the workhorse of what you're going to see in a shop. Um, I didn't mention earlier, this is obviously an off-car brake lathe. I'm not bringing the car over here to turn the rotor. There are on-car brake lathes also, uh, which maybe we'll discuss in another segment. So. Okay, so we're going to take the rotor, we need to mount the rotor onto the lathe within itself. First thing we need to do is we need to make sure that there are no metal shavings or anything. Obviously we're cutting metal, so there's going to be metal flying around here. We don't want any metal shavings on the back or on the arbor within itself. So I'm going to clean off the arbor. I'm also then going to give it a real quick shot. Just a little bit of BB blaster so that my tooling will slide off and on easily. I'm going to get my initial mounting flange here. Uh, if you look on the inside of the flange, it has a raised part and that's going to be for my spring. So if you're trying to figure out which flange to use first, uh, we're going to be using centering cones, which we'll get to in a second, but this is going to keep pressure on the centering cone because keeping the rotor centered on the lathe obviously is going to be uh, very important. Again, with my flange, I'm just going to give it a quick wipe on the back. Make sure there's no burrs, no dirt. A little bit of spray, nice and easy. Next thing I need to do is find the cone that's going to fit in the center of the rotor itself. You see I've got five different size cones here. I'm going to pick the cone that's going to go halfway. You'll notice that the cone, well, is conical, is cone shaped. And the idea of it is to go into the center of the rotor, but not all the way through. What this is going to do is this is going to center the rotor itself. Before we go any further, I'd like to talk about the cones a second. Um, also another mistake I see students using quite a bit. Um, as you can see, these are two cones. One is obviously thicker than the other. Um, these are for old school mounting tooling. Okay, these are for the new style that we're going to talk about in a second here. You definitely want to use the thinner ones. Don't use the thicker ones. The problem is these are going to bottom out on my flanges when I'm bolting these on and the rotor won't be centered. Okay, so make sure you use, and they're all going to be up here. Hopefully they'll all be in the back of the lathe, but if you find one of these thicker cones, uh, refrain from using it. Figured out what flange is going to center on my rotor. I put the flange on next. Nice and, oh. and now I'm going to start to mount the rotor. So the rotor's on the lathe. Next thing we need to do is we need to get our flange. Uh, this thing has some heft to it. This is a good 20 pounds. Since they took the hubs out of the rotor, the rotors are a lot lighter, uh, easier to manufacture, cheaper to manufacture. Unfortunately, the lighter rotors also have a tendency to vibrate. One of the big things we're going to be doing here is we're going to go through two or three steps that are vital to try to reduce or eliminate vibration. We start getting vibration while the rotor is being cut and we might as well throw the rotor out. We get a real inconsistent cut and it's shot. Okay, so this thing I want to use uh, the biggest flange I can. If we look at the flange, we're going to see one side is kind of scooped out, hollowed out here, and one side is flat. Uh, the reason that this side is recessed going into the inside is so that the cone fits in the inside of the flange. Okay, so this side always goes towards the rotor. So when I'm looking at this side of the arbor, this is the part of the flange I'm going to see. Use the biggest one you can that doesn't get in the way of you cutting the rotor. You just want to size it up. That looks really good. I've added a lot of weight here. From here I need to size it. I'm not sure which spacers I'm going to need. A variety of spacers, no matter what I'm doing, I always want to use. You'll see a couple of two or three of these in here. This is a split spacer. I think they call these a self-aligning spacer. What's important about this spacer is it's got a rubber dampener in between. What do you think the rubber's for? I talked about vibration. We're going to add some rubber to this now. We've added mass. Now we're going to try to add some rubber. We're going to try to absorb some of this vibration. So whatever spacer we use, we want to use one. You'll notice if you take a look, this one's got another nice uh, rubber isolator on the middle of it. So I'm always going to put the isolated one on first. 
I've got a couple of different uh, spacers here. There's certainly more all around if these don't work. Last thing we're going to do is we're going to put it on. Um, this is a special nut. This is a brake lathe nut, okay? First thing we need to know about this is left hand thread. What does that mean? It's not righty tighty lefty loosey, it's lefty tighty righty loosey. It's even tough to say because we're so programmed to go the other way, okay? So this is a reverse thread nut, so when I'm tightening this, I'm actually going to turn it counterclockwise or in a left direction. Uh, secondly, it's only knurled halfway through, so I can change the depth of my mounting just by if I put the nut on this way or this way, because it's only threaded halfway through. So if I need to take up more space, I put it on where it's not threaded. If I'm tight on the threads here, I put it on the way of the thread. So it's reverse thread. And it's also sort of threaded halfway through. So we've got that tight. The last thing we want to do, obviously, is tighten it up. Um, looks like a common wrench, but there's a reason there's uh, it's a combination wrench. Uh, these two sizes fit the lathe. One's for our nut up on top, and one is going to be to tighten this. You don't have to go nuts with it. I like to get it over. I just like to give it a couple of hits, and that's going to be tight enough on the brake lathe. I'm looking at this, I want to reduce more vibration. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a vibration strap on it. We've got more rubber, of course, with more mass. So again, we're going with the mass, we're going with the rubber. This is going to go around the rotor itself. All right, we've got the vibration strap on. We've got everything mounted. I feel pretty good about that. All right, next I have to set up the facing tool. This needs to be adjusted a little bit. These are going to be locks. I'm going to back off the locks. I'm going to back off my cutters. I want to back them off an equal amount before I center the facing tool here. So my two cutters, I brought them back enough for this rotor. So we're going to loosen the nut on the facing tool. And I want to center it so that the rotor is going to come right in this slot right here. I've got my cutting bits backed off so I'm going to have no interference. That looks good. I'm not into the rotor yet. I'm set up to do a cut or at least to start doing a cut. What I want to do now is a dummy check. A dummy check is I want to stand back. I want to make sure there's nothing in the way. I want to make sure I'm not wearing any jewelry. If I have long hair, I want to make sure that it's back in a ponytail. Uh, people have died using these machines before. This machine will win. If there's a piece of your clothing, a lanyard, uh, long hair, anything that gets caught when this machine starts turning, the machine's going to win. Okay, so this isn't a toy. This is something that you really need to be cognizant of and respect this piece of machinery. It can hurt you. Okay. I want to do a dummy check. I'm going to turn it on. I want to make sure everything is running smoothly. I want to make sure that there's no stupid hops within the rotor. Just a kind of, again, a dummy check. Does everything look okay? Does, does anything seem out of line right now with the machine running? And the answer is it looks to me like everything's going to be okay. All right. Next thing I'm going to do, take the handle here. I'm going to move my facing tool in. I'm going to go about halfway in the rotor. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to, these bits that I backed off earlier, I want to get the bits and I pretty much want to find zero. I want to find the point where I'm just barely touching the rotor on either side. So I'm going to give each side, I'm going to bring it out. You probably can't see it well from your angle, but you'll be able to hear it. You can see I'm just starting to touch the rotor now. I'm going to call that zero. That's going to be my zero reference point. And I'm going to do the same on the other side. Again, nice and easy till I just start hearing it touch. And we're set to go. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring the cutter all the way in. I want to go past the surface area of where the brake pads are going to ride. Uh, the basic rule of thumb is you need to take at least two thousandths of an inch per side off. Uh, they claim that that will heat up the bits and the bits will uh, be damaged prematurely. I've never tried it, but you always want to go at least two thousandths of an inch on either side. 
uh, two thousands is two notches uh, here on the gauges, so that makes life real easy. I'm going to go with three per side, so I'm going to take a total of six thousandths off. If I remember correctly, we had what sixty-five thousandths to play with, so you know we're in real good shape. I'm going three thousandths on this side. I'm tightening three thousandths on this side. We're going to take a six thousandths cut. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to tighten up my bits. Be careful tightening these. Don't get your fingers in the way. If you don't feel confident that you can do that, turn off the machine, tighten up the bits, and now turn the machine back on, okay? If you get your fingers stuck in there, the machine's gonna win. Again, and I like having 10 fingers, that's pretty awesome. I'm pretty much ready to make a cut. The last thing I need to do is engage the machine. That's gonna be the lever back here. This is the engagement lever. Uh, the engagement lever has two positions, away from me and towards me. If I go towards me, I'm gonna make a fast cut. If I go away from me, I'm gonna make a slow cut. The slow cut should be for my final cut. Um, slow cut takes about seven or eight minutes per cut. Uh, I wanna go fast cut first, because I wanna see, I don't know how much I have to take off of this rotor to make it true. So I'm gonna lift up on the handle. I'm gonna pull the handle towards me. You can see it's coming out fairly quickly. This is only gonna take a minute or two. Okay, awesome. You can hear it. I'm done making my cut. I'm going to disengage the feed lever. I'm going to turn it off. I want to see how my cut looks. Make sure I got a good cut all the way around the rotor. And granted, I started with a new rotor, so we would hope that uh, this would be a fairly easy cut. And it is. I've got a nice cut going all the way back on the rotor. Um, if I were close, I would take another measurement right now with a micrometer, but knowing that I've got you know, 50 plus thousands to work with still after this cut. I'm gonna continue uh, till the end. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna make my final cut, which is gonna be my fine cut. A fine cut, the machine's gonna move slower, so the grooves, and you can feel some of the grooves, this is somewhat of a rough cut. Uh, fine cut, the machine's gonna move slow, I'm gonna get rid of the groove feeling, and the objective will be to get a really nice, uh, shiny, smooth finish. I'm going to turn the machine back on, with it running, I feed the cutting tool back in. And it makes sense. I want to preserve this rotor as long as possible. So I'm going to take off as little material as possible. I mentioned earlier 2000s per side is the least you want to do. And I know I've got a, you know, I've got a good cut right now. I just want to smooth it up, so I'm going to just go 2000s on either side. Cuz at this point all I want to do is smooth it out. I've gone two thousandths on either side. Now I want to get the slow cut moving. I'm going to lift the handle and I'm going to move the handle away from me. You can tell right away how much slower it's going. Like I said, this is going to be a good five minutes. So. At no point am I moving any further away. I'm getting out of the picture, but I'm not going to get a cup of coffee or to wash my hands or talk to my buddy. I'm watching the machine. If I hear any strange noises, I want to Make sure nobody's around here clowning around. I'm responsible for this machine running right now. Okay, so I want to be, I'm within a jump's distance. I start making noises. If I start seeing anything out of the ordinary, out of character, okay, I need to be able to shut, come over here and shut the machine down quickly. So. We've, uh, we've completed our second cut. I'm going to put the feed lever in the neutral position. I want to shut it down and I want to check out my work here. Nice and smooth. Everything looks good. There, there were no noises while we were cutting them. No strange anomalies. Okay. Uh, before I take this off, I am going to do another measurement with the micrometer just to make sure we stayed within specifications. Again, simple math is going to tell us that we've taken, I think, what, three, then two, so we've taken 10 thousandths off thus far, so we should have a good 55 thousandths left, I believe, but still, I'll take a quick reading with my micrometer, put the lock on, slide it out, and uh, 25, 35, I'm about 938, uh, 940 thousandths. So we're 
easily within specifications. We have all kinds of uh, all kinds of room left on this rotor. There shouldn't be any problem. The machine's off. I'm going to take it off the machine, and you're going to see what we're going to do next. So we've got this nice, shiny, smooth cut pattern. Uh, one of the things through the years that the manufacturers have decided is although this is a nice smooth surface, they want us to rough it up a little bit. Uh, the idea is, especially with metallic pads, or I guess even ceramic brake pads, that if this is too smooth, um, it's not going to break in the brake pads in time. So believe it or not, now that I've got a mirror finish almost on this rotor, after I take the rotor off, I'm going to take a whizzy wheel on a grinder, and I'm going to rough it up a little bit. I'm going to use a fiber disc so it's really not going to penetrate the metal all that much. All it's going to do is give me an inconsistent surface and that will help that will help uh, with the pads, the brand new brake pads breaking in. Using my grinder here, I'm using a standard Rolock disc. Uh, they do sell discs uh, specifically meant to do this, but the Rolox work fine, okay? All I want to do is rough up my smooth surface real quick. Uh, guys, this is not something we want to spend 10 minutes doing. In fact... <coughs> that's all I want to do, okay? I want to rough up my cut just a little bit to help break in the new brake pads. All right, as promised, last step, real simple. Got a bucket here, I'm gonna get a little bit of water going. High tech formula. Oh, look at this. Right into the bucket. Scrub everything off real quick, give it a quick rinse and we're done. There we go, ready to be installed.